Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to our last program of the season, the last program of the Marin chapter of the World Affairs Council. Our uh, subject today is why did the uh, disaffected French reelect uh, Emmanuel Macron as president? Our speaker, I am happy to say, is Patrick Chamorel on the faculty of Stanford in Washington and Stanford here. Also a frequent commentator on international political affairs. And uh, also <clears throat> the kind of guy we really like to have as a speaker. Not only is he a, a polished academic, but he, uh, in his, uh, early in his career, he served as an advisor to various French governments, French prime ministers. So he's a guy who has gotten his hands dirty, as we like to say, on the ground level as well. And uh, we will be, uh, we will have no programs in July and August. Our next program after this one will be on September 20th. Our old friend Peter Bartu of the International uh, uh, Studies Group at uh, uh, UC Berkeley will be talking on the Middle East. It's a little early to say exactly what he'll be talking about, but I know Peter is hoping to visit Saudi Arabia this summer. Anyway, see you on September 20th. And now, Patrick, over to you. Thank you very much, Frank. I'm thrilled to be with you tonight. Um, I really wish I'd be in, a, in Marin County uh, myself, uh, except that uh, I would not, I, you know, because I would be among you, of course, and also because the temperature would be 20 degrees less than in Washington, D.C., where I stand. Um, and, and you know that summers in Washington, D.C. Are, are, are the worst. But uh, I want to thank um, Carol Possin for reaching out to me, for to Frank again for inviting me and uh, sharing uh, you know, information about uh, you know, the interests and, uh, and the deep knowledge of your group. So I look forward to uh, interacting with you uh, in the Q&A, a part of the, of the talk. Okay. Uh, uh, Patrick, can I interrupt just for a second? Yes, please submit your questions to the by clicking on the Q and A prompt on the bottom of your screen. There will be no oral questions. Right. Sorry. Okay. Oh, of course. So I'm going to speak for about forty minutes, and then, of course, again, uh, we will. Be, I'll be happy to take your questions. Um, it's a very timely uh, moment. Uh, to uh, look at uh, French politics since we are uh, in the middle, literally in the middle of uh, legislative elections. Um, the first round of, of these elections to the National Assembly, which is one of the two chambers, we, along with the Senate, took place last Sunday. And the final uh, round of voting, which we usually call the runoff, is happening this coming Sunday, so we, we are really in the middle of, of of the of the of the cyclone in a way, and of course you know the uh, presidential elections took place just eight weeks ago in April, and as as we know, Emmanuel Macron, the incumbent president, was re-elected against Marine Le Pen, but I have plenty of opportunity to talk about this, so this explains why I broaden the topic a little bit from uh, just the uh, presidential elections to you know you know trying to look at how the current election cycle that means the presidential and the legislative elections which follow uh, shortly after uh, keep transforming french politics um, so just like in the united states there are two main elections national elections in France, the presidential and the legislative ones. The difference with the United States are, first of all, that they are direct elections. There's no like electoral college or anything like that. Second, that there are two rounds of voting, as I just said, with the second round uh, between the two top vote getters of the first round. And the third, uh, uh, difference is is about uh, you know cohabitation. 
which is not exactly the same as divided government in the United States, you know, when the legislative, you know, the Congress is, uh, is uh, held by a different party than the presidents. In France, when the National Assembly is on the other side from the president, uh, we call this cohabitation. It has happened twice in the Fifth Republic, in the late 80s and the late 90s. And this is not just the legislative against the executive, but it's, it's the executive itself, which is split into two, which is divided between the president on one hand and the prime minister who represents the majority in the assembly. So the fact that this cohabitation in the past led to political gridlock uh, led to you know, a reform in the early 2000s that changed the duration of the, of the presidential term from seven years to five years, and also uh, scheduled the legislative elections right after uh, the presidential elections to maximize the chances that the presidential momentum will lead to a majority on the same side as the president. So, so this is uh, the outline of what I am going to say tonight, um, just to you know, set the, the context uh, of the politics of the Fifth Republic then focus on the critical 2017 uh, presidential elections, which I compared with a political tsunami. Then uh, look at Macron's first term, which was a very eventful and rocky uh, first term. And then get to the, you know, the plat de résistance, pardon my French, which is uh, the presidential elections. Uh, and then of course talk about the the current legislative elections and what could happen in Macron's second term and what is likely to uh, happen uh, uh, you know, in the future in the, in the political realignment of French politics that, that, uh, that started you know, you know, a decade ago, but really accelerated in the last uh, two electoral cycles. 2017 and 22. So these are the eight presidents of the Fifth Republic, which was established by General de Gaulle in 1958. Um, five of those presidents were on the right, meaning the center right, two on the left, you know, the Socialist Party being the dominant party of the left, and one in the center, and that's Macron, is the first president to uh, be positioned in the center, bringing together the center right and the center left. Um, so, these, so, so the first three presidents were on the right. Then there was this critical elections in 1981 that brought Mitterrand you know, to, to power and a socialist to power for the first time in the Fifth Republic. And then there were alternations between the, the right and the left, you know, Giscard on the right, Mitterrand on the left, Chirac on the right, Sarkozy on the, uh, on the right also, actually, Hollande uh, on the left. So Macron has, is the first president to be re-elected outside of cohabitation, as I defined it a few minutes ago, and uh, which is, of course, uh, you know, more difficult because uh, at least he can blame the majority in parliament for all the unpopular measures that were taken in the, during, the, during his presidency. So, so again, the very typical um, uh, alternations in the Fifth Republic was between the neo gaullists which, which are on the center right, and the socialist. So typically you had Sarkozy, you know, winning against the socialist candidate in, nine, in 2007, see Sarkozy, 53% in the runoff versus Ségolène Royal, 50, 46, almost 47%. 2017, 
uh, that was considered a big victory because the, uh, the, usually those scores are very tight and they were tighter in 2012 where uh, Sarkozy didn't win re-election and Hollande uh, became president with 51% of the vote. But in the meantime, uh, as you know, the central right and central left were alternating in power, you had you know, a new political party that was growing and growing fast. And that was what's called the Front National, National Front. Uh, now it has a different name, the National Rally, uh, led by uh, uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen, the father of Marine Le Pen. Uh, and you see that in the, between 2002, which is when uh, for the first time, uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen uh, acceded to the runoff of the presidential election in 2017, you see in each professional category how, how much the Front National has, has progressed. And you see it mostly among factory workers, ouvriers here means factory workers, and the Front National became the number one uh, party of, of those workers with a majority, above 50% of them voting for the National Front. So, so the progression in all those categories uh, is spectacular. So this is, I'm sorry, it's a little fuzzy, but um, you see that Jean-Marie Le Pen uh, won uh, you know, access to the runoff in 2002. He scored 16.9% uh, uh, in the first round and barely more in the second round, 17.8, because he didn't have any allies. And, and he was kind of, uh, you know, uh, considers, you know, like toxic, so no other parties wanted to, to get into an alliance with him. Uh, he didn't make it in 2000 to the runoff in 2007, and Sarkozy actually was able to, to reduce the score of the National Front to 10% in the first round. The Front National did not make it in 2012 either uh, to the runoff, but scored uh, almost 18% in the first round. In 2017, 21% and made, made the, the runoff to almost 34%, and even more in 2022, just a few months ago, 23% uh, and 42% uh, in the runoff. So you see the, the trend is clearly up with three times the Front National being in the runoff. But, when it does get into the runoff, it loses big. You see that uh, was especially the case of Jean-Marie Le Pen in 2002, who scored less than 18%, and Jacques Chirac, the incumbent, 82%. Uh, the scores were a little tighter, but still very large for Macron when he won in, in 2017, 66 versus almost 34, and even more this time, I mean, I'm sorry, and the, the, uh, and, and the Front National uh, gained some more, you know, uh, this last uh, April with almost 42% of the vote. So you see that how much and how fast, you know, French politics has changed from, you know, an alternation between the central right president and central left presidents to uh, the national front, which we can position on the far right, you know, having made uh, the runoff of presidential election three times and losing big, yes, but uh, gaining each and every time. So in the last two elections, the, we didn't have any candidate from the center right, center left making it into the runoff. Both times it has been Macron, the centrist, and Le Pen on the far right, 
So, so a totally different map, electoral map. And I mentioned here to the right, there's the picture of Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who is on the far left, we'll talk more about him. Uh, and that is a third poll, if you want, of French politics, which is rising uh, right now. Uh, and that has risen uh, to the front right now. And therefore, you're creating a third poll in French politics. So Macron in the middle, and then the other two polls are one on the far left and one on the far right, which is not you know, a very good situation as you can imagine, because there is no alternation possible outside of the extremists. So that's the, the context leading to the critical elections of 2017. That was the mother of all elections in the Fifth Republic. So that took place at the end of the presidency of Francois Hollande, the socialist, which, and it, that was a, a fair presidency. As you can see, Francois Hollande's, you know, popularity uh, approval ratings have been the lowest of all the uh, last six French presidents. And that's because the socialist party, his own party, you know, broke apart. Uh, Macron tried to, you know, pursue a social democratic moderate uh, path, and lots of its the rank and file of his party uh, challenged that from uh, the traditional left side of the party. So that means, like, look at the Francois. That's the polls before the first round of elections in 2017, and you see Francois Hollande as an incumbent, his polls are 9%. See how much lower can you get than that? And he withdrew from the race. He had to withdraw from the race. Um, so he was, there was still another candidate from the left, so, but a candidate from the far left, which therefore had much more political space you know, to, uh, to, to run without the Socialist Party. And then you see that it was going to be an alternation as usual. So the Socialist Party and Francois Hollande loses big, uh, but Francois Fillon, the candidate of, of the center right was going to win. And his polls went even beyond 30% at some point. Of course, there's Marine Le Pen who does you know, better than ever before. And you see Emmanuel Macron at 14%. So that's before the first round of 2017. And now he's, here is the first round, the actual first round of voting in 2017. And you see that Francois Fillon is at 19 instead of, you know, 10 points more. He loses 10 points. Why? Is because two and a half months before, the election, he was caught into a scandal involving his wife, who had claimed for to work for Francois Fillon in the National Assembly for many years. And actually, we discovered that she had never worked there, but she was paid. <laughs> uh, so that completely uh, that hit Francois Fillon a, a, a great deal. And uh, and you see that Emmanuel Macron, remember, he was at 14%, now he's 23 so Fillon down 10%, Macron up 10%, Marine Le Pen remains about the same, and Mélenchon grows to also 19% on the far left. So the left is represented by, by someone from the, from the far left uh, of the political spectrum. And of course, uh, the, in, the, in the runoff, you have Macron uh, and Le Pen, and uh, Macron wins, you know, handily because he gets most of the vote of the Fillon uh, voters, you know, the center right voters, and uh, Marine Le Pen has no allies. And again, in the runoff, you need allies to go much higher than your first round score. 
So for the first time, there is no gaullist or socialist in the runoff, but a centrist and a far right candidate. And you see that the, the electorates are very, very contrasted. Uh, Emmanuel Macron is in blue, Marine Le Pen in black. And you see that in the most prestigious professions, Macron is way ahead. Among factory workers, Marine Le Pen is way ahead. Among employees, Marine Le Pen is ahead. Among the middle class, Marine Le Pen is ahead. And uh, Macron, I'm sorry, is ahead. And among small business owners, Macron is ahead. But, but you see the trend is that the more educated, the more affluent you are, the more likely you, you, you voted for Macron and the opposite for Le Pen. So it became, you know, both Macron and Le Pen said that they don't believe in class politics. They, are, they don't consider themselves to be either on the right or the left. Uh, yet we were back from 20, in 2017 to kind of a, you know, a, a, a class division of the electorate very stark division by, by social class. And this is what happened in the National Assembly that you know, was elected just after the presidential elections. You see that if you take the 2012 election to the National Assembly, you have most deputies, uh, maybe 90% of the deputies being split between you know, the Socialist Party and the neo gaullist Party with very small uh, representation for the far right or the far left. And in 2017, Macron, who had no political party of his own before running, is getting a majority. So he's having a very strong majority for a party that was really uh, didn't exist just a few months earlier. And uh, the center right gaullists lose half of their deputies and the left, especially the socialists, the socialists lose 90% of their deputies. So, so you see that the political landscape is transformed very significantly. Now let's get to, you know, let's say a few words about Macron's presidency so far, I mean, in his first term. So uh, he said that he was introducing a revolution, but he, met, he, he meant a revolution because he was bringing together the center right, part of the center right and part of the center left in a new centrist party. Uh, and that he was very central to the political landscape with two oppositions, one on the left and one on the right. But his revolution was not in policies. Actually, he pursued you know, neoliberal policies like uh, to, to make the labor market more flexible or to lower taxes on capital, these kind of things. Uh, so a few people noticed that. They said, well, how come that you know, Macron, I voted for him because I don't want Marine Le Pen. And now he's pursuing these policies which he had not articulated very clearly during his campaign. And we disagree with these policies. Uh, and that triggered the Yellow Vest uh, movement uh, 18 months after he, Macron's election. And that almost uh, uh, ended Macron's presidency very few observers thought that he could even remain president, so weak he had become. So, so those uh, yellow vests, you know, they revolted and you know, went onto the, on the street for about one year every Saturday. And they were not, uh, and I, I will show in the next slide, you know, who, who they were. And then of course, uh, Macron's presidency at first term was marked by two other major crises, the COVID crisis 
and the Ukraine crisis. And Macron, if you remember, was the, the chair of the European Council uh, when that happened. So this is the, these are the supporters of the Yellow Vest uh, uh, protesters. And you see that they are mostly on the fringes, on the political fringes. LFI is Mélenchon's party, the far left. 93% of them support the Yellow Vest. On the Rassemblement National, on the far right, 77% of them support uh, the Yellow Vest. So, uh, and of course, the, 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 the moderate left and the moderate right are split. And of course, the president has, has some support too. But it was a movement by, by people who uh, had the you know, low educational level, levels, no in, low income level, were mostly in rural areas. And, uh, and, and so that was a very you know, stark uh, you know, social economic profile that these, these people had. Another way to look at the Macron's uh, first term is, is who uh, was with him and who was against him. So to that question, in your opinion, is Macron a good president? The majority says no, uh, which is interesting for a president who, again, has, has won the election uh, by 66%. 66%. And, and that is you know, the question we have to answer. Uh, why was he re-elected? And we'll see that in a minute. So on the right, Macron has the support of two groups, uh, which are, well, let's say, uh, as the support of the pro-business constituencies because of the kind of reform he's been pushing, but is opposed by the harder right. Uh, and not just, I mean, part of the uh, uh, neo gaullist and of course the, uh, Le Pen supporters, because he's been judged too soft on crime, and crime has, has really exploded during Macron's uh, presidency, immigration and um, and uh, terrorism, which and, and there were many instances of of terrorism. On the left, he's supported by the cultural progressives, mostly young people in urban areas, but he's opposed by the traditional economic left, which things that his policies advantage the rich too much at the expense of the poor. So in, in partisan terms, that translates into, see the, the France Insoumise, which is Macron's far less party. So 80% of them oppose uh, Macron. In the Socialist Party, they are split. Same on the neo Party, they are split. Uh, but Marine Le Pen's party, 84% of them oppose Macron. Uh, and of course, in Macron's own party, he, of course, he has a majority of support. So it was a revolution, but not the kind of revolution that people expected. They, they had basically voted for Macron in opposition to Le Pen. And Macron uh, had been very discreet about, about his program. And they discovered, but maybe too late, uh, that his program was not the kind that they were ready to support. And actually, they. Uh, rejected it. So, but Macron, of course, you know, bounced back. So he is going down, you know, after his uh, neoliberal reforms, you know, president of the rich, he's going down at the beginning of the yellow vest movement, but then he starts, you know, creeping back up until the election because he, he uh, managed to uh, tell you know, people on the right, oh, look at all of these protesters, these yellow vests, uh, they are, you know, a source of, of, of political and civil disorder, and, and people, you know, some people got uh, scared. Then he, his policy, policies against COVID was not necessarily all, all uh, successful, but he, uh, you know, he, he, he occupied center stage, and then we'll see the third uh, crisis, Ukraine benefited to him a, a great, a great, uh, a great deal. 
So this is now we are going to look at the first one of the presidential election that was last April. You see 12 candidates, which is in the norm of the Fifth Republic. And you have, as always in France, you know, the far left is well represented, but doesn't get many votes. So these three here are, the, the, this is the edge, and which is the, the number mentioned to, after their name. So here the far left, but, uh, you know, doesn't get so much, so many votes. Then Mélenchon, who is the oldest of the candidates, you know, with the Bernie Sanders of, of France in a way. Uh, Jadot, who is uh, the leader of the Greens, the Greens had a primary. You can, you, you know, some parties choose to have primaries, others don't. Hidalgo is for the Socialist Party. So you have six of the 12 on the left and the remainder, then Macron in the center and the remainder on the right with two moderate right and two uh, on the far right. And, and what's new here is that for the first time, Marine Le Pen is not the only representative of the far, uh, candidate of the far right. There is also Eric Zemmour, who is a famous political journalist, uh, an intellectual uh, and uh, uh, an anti-immigration advocate. So those are the main five. And the, the new ones, because three of them had run the previous time, the, the two new ones are, of course, Zemmour, that I just mentioned, but also Valérie Pécresse, who is trying to save her center-right party, the neo-Gaulist party, uh, but uh, which had uh, you know, lose, lost uh, stream because it was split, basically, many of those uh, um, center-right folks you know, joined uh, Macron. Um, so this is a little bit intimidating, <laughs> but let me very quickly make uh, sense of this or try to. You know, there is, this is where the five main candidates are positioned ideologically. And you see that on, on a cultural liberalism axis and a free market axis. So Macron, of course, is both pro-market, uh, so you know, market economics, market economics, but also a cultural, you know, progressively, you know, culturally. Uh, the difference with the, the traditional center right is that Pécresse is, is for restricting immigration somewhat, uh, but she's also a free market uh, advocate. On, then you have two which are uh, anti-immigration, Le Pen and Zemmour, and the, the difference between them is that Zemmour is, believes in free market. Marine Le Pen is actually uh, uh, you know, very much a socialist uh, compared, compared with Zemmour. And then Mélenchon is, is uh, anti-capitalist, uh, but is pro-immigration. So what's interesting is to compare Le Pen and Zemmour, because that's really an innovation uh, in this election, uh, that uh, the far right is split by level of education, that's the, and by place of residence. So level education to the left, place of residence to the right, Zemmour in, in blue and Marine Le Pen in purple. So you see that uh, in level of education, Marine Le Pen has, you know, a, uh, loses support as you go up in the social economic ladder in the economic and, and educational ladder and macron and i'm sorry and and uh, zemmour is mostly in in cities whereas marine le pen is mostly in rural areas so they have very different types of of constituencies now originally uh, Le Pen, again, is in rural areas and Zemmour in the cities. Uh, this is on the left where Zemmour, that is the scores that Zemmour uh, reaches in each and every region. So, you know, it's around between, let's say, 10 and 20 percent. And you see that he, he, his best scores are in the south of France. And you see here is the gap between Le Pen's scores 
and Zemmour scores, and you see that there is almost no gap in the South. So Zemmour is a candidate who does well in the South because it's a more conservative area in the country uh, than you know, more Northern areas. So now the dynamics of the race. So you see that Emmanuel Macron has led all along and that this bump here is Ukraine. So of course, because he was the president of the European Council, because he had lots of visibility during the Ukraine crisis, Macron, Macron benefits from that. Um, and uh, you would think that uh, others who were Sympath more sym sympathetic to Putin, like Marine Le Pen, like Mélenchon on the far left, and like Zemmour, you would suffer from, from that uh, crisis in Ukraine. But only Zemmour did suffer. Actually, there was uh, an influence by, uh, of, the European, of, the, of the Ukrainian crisis, but not exactly in, foreign, in, you know, in terms of foreign policy or, or Putin, or et cetera. It was mostly economic because Marine Le Pen has focused her campaign on bread and butter issues, cost of living, you know, because of COVID that inflation had gone up and it goes up even more with Ukraine. And so Marine Le Pen benefits greatly from this crisis. Mélenchon, it benefits from, from the fact that all, all left voters wanted to try to qualify their candidate for the runoff, you know, to beat Marine Le Pen at it. And Zemmour and Pécresse are the losers. And you see, they have done very well before the, before the, U, the Ukraine crisis. With Ukraine, the crisis, uh, the voters of Valérie Pécresse, you know, central white people, they go to, to Macron because of his uh, visibility. And it is, Zemmour, is, his major issues like immigration are completely, uh, are completely uh, overlooked, if you want, they are overshadowed by, by Ukraine and, and people would rather vote for Marine Le Pen. So, so you have, so Marine Le Pen and Emmanuel Macron again qualify. So you, Ukraine, of course, is a major concern for most of, of, the, of the French, uh, but so 80%, 87%, but you see that it's not the war in Ukraine here, 15 percent people consider uh, is important in their vote. And the purchasing power is, is, the most, is the most important by far, by far. And that was, again, that was Marine Le Pen's issue. So instead of choosing immigration, which is her staple issue as the main issue of her campaign, she left immigration or part of it to, to Eric Zemmour and she focused on, 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 on the cost of living. And, and she was, you know, boosted, of course, by, by the Ukraine crisis. So this is the results of the first round of the presidential elections this past uh, April. So you see that each, you, so you have three candidates that do over 20% and the rest all below 10%. So those, Emmanuel Macron does better than five years ago, Marine Le Pen a little better than five years ago, and so does Mélenchon, a little better. So they tend to concentrate more votes than ever before. And you see after that, that the Socialist Party, which was weakened uh, considerably with, uh, with, uh, uh, with François Hollande five years ago, did not recover, never recovered. So the Socialist Party represented by the mayor of Paris, Anne Hidalgo, did 1.75%. So this is a party that has dominated the Fifth Republic and which is very, very close to disappearing. And then Valérie Pécresse, you know, she, she didn't win her bet of bringing her party back. And that means that uh, after the Socialist Party five years ago, the center-right party uh, called LR, Les Républicains, also has collapsed, has collapsed this time around. And, and, and yes, I put uh, you know, the, the difference with 2017 is just that the same three candidates, Macron, Le Pen, and, 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 uh, and, and, and Mélenchon, 
and this is where see Fillon at twenty percent still after his after his uh, scandal, and now again Pécresse from the same party has less than five percent. So these are the three phases of the <laughs> of, of 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 the of the conflicting visions of France, as I call it. So you have Marine Le Pen, a nationalist and populist. She's very strong in small towns and rural areas. She's, she does very, very well among uh, factory workers and among the young, uh, especially young uh, workers. Macron is pro-European, he's a reformist. He's, uh, he, he has lots of uh, support in city centers among affluent, uh, voters among the seniors and the bobos. I don't know if everybody understands the bobos, the bourgeois bohemians, meaning that you know they are the young who you know do well in 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 central cities, but are culturally progressive. And as for Mélenchon, is populist like Marine Le Pen, anti-capitalist is on the left, on the far left, but and he does very well among the young, especially in college towns, the educated middle class and among immigrants. 70% of uh, Muslims in France voted for him. Then you have, so you see here that between 17 and 22, Marine Le Pen has gained more ground. And you see that Mélenchon comes uh, number one in some cities, the Paris region, because you have lots of uh, you know, youth and college college towns and lots of immigration. And you see that in the uh, overseas territories, especially in the Antilles, uh, Ma Ma Mélenchon also uh, leads. So by age, you see that you have three candidates who do very well among the, the young. Mélenchon on the far left, Jadot because he's a green candidate, you know, that appeals to young, and, and Le Pen as, as well as Macron. So four who do pretty well among the young. Uh, there are three that do very badly among the young, it's, and, and well among the older uh, generations. Hidalgo, so an old, the old establishment, you know, the socialist establishment does not do well. Uh, Zemmour doesn't do well uh, with the young, and Pécresse, not at all. So basically, the two parties that have collapsed and that used to be dominant in the Fifth Republic do worse among the young and best among the seniors, which makes sense in many ways because of the cohort uh, phenomenon. So now let's look at the second round of the, of the election. So you have these two who were qualified. Uh, and so, of course, you know, they, they went after the votes of Mélenchon because he had the most votes by far uh, outside of, 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 the, of the two qualified. And that means that both Marine Le Pen and, uh, and Macron, they really courted the left uh, and, uh, and you see that most of the Mélenchon voters, they vote for Macron, mostly because, not that they like Macron, uh, but mostly because they don't like Le Pen. They abstain at 24%. They put like blank, blank uh, ballots uh, by 17% of them. They reject basically the choice they have. And Le Pen benefits from 17% of the far left. And that is of course, you know, a question it's because mostly it's uh, is the populist uh, populist reaction against the establishment. Um, yes, Frank. Uh, Patrick, I think we should uh, perhaps leave some room for questions now. No, absolutely. Right. So, okay, let me. So, so you you have the result. You know the result. I'm going to go in in five more minutes, if if I may, uh, Frank. Okay. Okay. So. Macron actually is not so well elected. He has a big margin of victory, but because of, of abstention, high abstention, he doesn't get you know, a high percentage, actually one of the lowest percentage of the, of the registered voters. Uh, so you see that uh, abstention has 
and blank votes have increased uh, for decades, and this continues. You see that see this is uh, this is uh, Marine Le Pen in dark in seventeen, in dark in twenty two, and you see Ambush, you know she's again over Macron uh, this time around. Uh, so by age again, you know M M uh, Le Pen has the advantage among the young, advantage among workers, advantage among low income people, and. Uh, uh, among the least educated. So now let me finish by, you know, looking at the current legislative election. So you see that even before this election, during the Macron first terms, his vast majority has shrunk, mostly because the left of his majority went, you know, either resigned or went back to the Socialist Party. So it has never been a very cohesive group. So the big surprise of this, of this uh, legislative election is, is the rise and the success uh, of Mélenchon, the far left candidate. So he's staged this election as a referendum on Macron, as if it was a midterm elections in the US, you know, but Macron was just reelected. So we don't need to have a referendum uh, about Macron, but most people want, uh, don't, don't, don't want to give Macron all the powers. So they are thinking of a cohabitation kind of situation, which would be, of course, very, uh, very difficult between Macron and Mélenchon. So what Mélenchon did is that he united the left, so they he put one single candidate of the left in each district, and he uh, signed up uh, the Socialist Party, the Communist Party, and the Greens to his own actually program. Uh, of course, you know these other parties have to make very many compromises, but they wanted to save the the seats they had they still had, and and get the funding uh, uh, from uh, you know the public funding as well. So the, the left is going to this election united, even though it's a fairly superficial, uh, artificial uh, union. And the right, on the contrary, is, is not united, with Le Pen and Zemmour unable to, to find an agreement. Macron thought you know, he would benefit from the momentum of his presidential victory. And, uh, and he is now not only against Le Pen, but against Le Pen and Mélenchon, which of course complicates his task. So you see that, that that is the result of the first round, which is just a few days ago, last Sunday. And you see that Macron and the, the, the left under the leadership of the far left are equal, they're around 25%. The, uh, which of course, uh, none, neither have, have, have done so well before. I mean, the, the far left never done so well before. Mélenchon a little less than five years ago. Le Pen a little better than five years ago. And the center right, you know, does a little better than the presidential elections because they have lots of local uh, incumbents. So, uh, so this is what the new National Assembly is likely to look like, you know, with a, sh a shrunk majority and maybe no majority at all for, for Macron. So how can he govern without a majority with the left Making a huge progression, uh, and the right, uh, you know, the center right dividing his deputies by half, and uh, Marine Le Pen kind of, but tripling is her number of of, of candidates of, of deputies. So how ma is Macron going to be governing without if he doesn't have a majority? Well, he can try with a minority, but it's not very stable. He can have. Uh, an alliance with the central right, but that's giving lots of leverage to the central right. And it can also dissolve the assembly, but that's pretty risky. So Macron is going to probably have a very difficult second term. Politically, you know, his, his position is fragilized and, uh, and he might uh, have great difficulties pursuing his, his, his agenda. You know, I, I mentioned inflation, I mentioned is a reform of the 
of the of pensions. Uh, he could have an, another yellow vest uh, uh, riot, riot, riot of maybe from the banlieue. In, uh, so there's lots of dangers uh, looming on the horizon. And then as for the realignment of French politics, which I have tried to describe, uh, is going to continue because Marine Le Pen and maybe Mélenchon uh, will retire and each party will have to uh, you know, transform itself. And the, 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 the goal being that right now, you know, there is no alternative. Uh, if you don't like uh, Macron, you have to vote for the extreme, which is which I call status quo or chaos. So that's how actually Ma Ma Macron can hold to power is because of the alternatives. So maybe that, maybe that realignment will lead to another uh, alternative, which is not extremist. And, and that's something to hope for. Well, thank you. Sorry for being a little long. Okay. Well, thank you. We have uh, a number of questions in the Q&A. Uh, Bill Medigovich, member of our steering committee, says that he recalls that Le Pen is reported to have received financial support from Putin. Is this accurate? And if even if it's not accurate, did, did this affect her voting total at all? You know, it, it is accurate. You know, she got a loan, but that was uh, that was uh, several years ago, um, and uh, and of course she was you know, widely criticized for it, including in the TV debate that preceded the, the runoff last uh, April with Macron. Macron you know, really uh, went uh, at her on that topic. Uh, but again, um, I think that didn't really impact uh, the race. Uh, what impacted the race is the economic fallout of the Ukraine crisis, especially inflation, and that benefited Le Pen. Oh, I see. The inflation benefit. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Oh, I see. That, that is quite interesting. Yes, yeah. indeed. Uh, Louis Dolinsky, former deputy foreign editor of the uh, San Francisco Chronicle, would like to know who won Corsica? <laughs> well, in Corsica, uh, it's, uh, it's Mélenchon. Uh, uh, Mélenchon and Le Pen are are the most powerful parties in Corsica. Uh, uh, Corsica is going through, you know, a crisis of its own. I mean, not that it uh, ever uh, was out of a crisis of, but uh, Corsica is is demanding more autonomy. You know, that's an old theme, and Macron is kind of uh, 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 is kind of inclined uh, to uh, give it what they want. But despite the fact that Macron could uh, accede to uh, the, the main demands by, by, by the Corsicans, they vote, they vote on the far right or the far left. You know, they are very populist. In, oh. uh, just in political culture, they are very populist. I have a question of my own. Uh, the headlines about France a year or two or three years ago were all about laïcité. Um, Burkinos, uh, Burkinis on the beach, uh, Charlie Hebdo, that sort of thing. Has that whole raft of issues involving the uh, Muslim population of, uh, of France come into uh, the action in the election at all? Oh, yes. Um, well, if your question is partly, you know, the, about the, the Muslim vote, I guess. Yes. Um, so the most involved is mostly on the left. It has been clearly for Francois Hollande in 2012. Uh, it was not uh, for uh, the left when in, in 2017 because of the, uh, of the gay marriage, which um, most Muslims uh, didn't support. And so they didn't want to, uh, you know, they didn't vote as they didn't turn out as much, and certainly not for the left as much. But this election, yes, they voted uh, uh, strongly for Mélenchon, um, very little, of course, for Le Pen. And uh, uh, 
yes, they, they are opposed to, most of them are opposed to laicity uh, because, uh, because it seems to be restricting you know, their religious expression as, as Muslims. Um, and, and so, yes, there's a, a, a you know, strong majority of them against laicity and they are supported by, by part of the left and, and certainly the far left. So Mélenchon, you know, is very even, though he is, is very much, uh, he's fairly ambiguous about it, but Mélenchon, yes, he is supporting, uh, uh, you know, the cause of, the, the main uh, cause of the, of, the, of the Muslims. Um, he says, of course, that he's for laicité, but, but he is, 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 is really not. <laughs> Yeah, you have to say you're for ACT in France, but but you know he, he he's actually courted the Muslim vote, you know, uh, very assiduously, and uh, and so th this is this is where we are right now. That's a fairly significant percentage of the voting population. So anyway, uh, well, yes, yes, of course they they are. I mean, they 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 tend to not vote as much as other categories of, of people, but. But yes, they, they, they are a growing uh, constituency and, uh, and they, uh, they, tend, they, you know, they, they tend to vote for the left. What's interesting is laicite itself was an idea of the left, but the left, yeah, from the you know, 19th century, it was an idea of the pro-democracy yeah. uh, uh, people against the monarchy, against the Catholic church. And, uh, and now, it has completely reversed. So laicity is supported mostly by, by the center and by the, the right, uh, and is, uh, is now criticized by, by the left, partly because the left you know, wants the, the Muslim vote. And I have another question here from Bill Medigovic. He, he wonders how you might place uh, the strength of Marine Le Pen in the context of the rise to power of people like Donald Trump and Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, people on the far, on more or less the far right of uh, yes. international politics. So uh, Marine Le Pen is um, economically very much a socialist. So, so I don't think that. Uh, neither Orban nor uh, nor uh, Trump uh, are that much on the left on economic issues. Is is again a reflection of our constituencies that are mostly made up of factory workers, employees, etc. Um, she is um, obviously against immigration, against uh, against um, you know. Uh, uh, Islam as, a, as as gaining more influence in French society, um, so so she, so that's also different than 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 uh, than either Orban or Trump who don't have to deal with that kind of issue. Uh, now she's anti-immigration. Trump also is anti-immigration, and so is Orban. Uh, so that that's uh, they they have a populist style. There's no question about it. Uh, so I would say, yes, uh, Marine Le Pen has a number of uh, common uh, characteristics with the other two that you mentioned. Um, but, uh, and, and, and Zemmour is more like, uh, you know, a real conservative, less populist than Marine Le Pen. So Zemmour would be uh, more like, uh, like, the, like the National Review, if you want. You know, like they are, he's, he's an intellectual, he's a, conservative intellectual, is not a populist, uh, is not socialist economically, is a, you know, for you know, free economy. Um, so Zemmour's, uh, Zemmour's uh, nemesis, if you want, is, is Mélenchon, because one is on the far, is very conservative and the other one is the far left. Yeah. So on the, on the left right spectrum, they are both at odds. Um, the nemesis of Marine Le Pen, if you want, is Macron himself, because he's called the president of the rich, uh, and she is trying to uh, defend the, the working class. You know. So it, it isn't an exact parallel at all. That's quite interesting. Uh, one last question, uh, also from uh, Louis Dolinsky. What was the logic of 
having the parliamentary elections come after the presidential elections well, rather than simultaneously as we do it here every four yeah. years. Absolutely. Well, it went along with the reduction of the presidential mandate from seven to five years. Uh, so there was not much space then, you know, in the middle of the five years to have to have legislative elections. But the reason really is to try to avoid cohabitation uh, because, you know, each presidential elections, there is a momentum uh, for the winner and that carries into the legislative elections. And so uh, Chirac who made those reforms, I mean, it was under Chirac, uh, uh, thought that, uh, you know, there was, it was more likely that the majority would, would mirror uh, the, the 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 colors the political colors of the of the of a new president, um, so so yes it's a, it's a big uh, change because you know it, it means that the legislative elections are just an appendix to the presidential elections they lose much in in importance in a way, uh, but Macron could very well be the first president not to have a majority even though in, in this new system where legislative elections take place just after the presidential elections. It's true that never, where well, we never had the case of a re-election. So re-election, you know, it's is more difficult to have a momentum, of course, than the first election. So, so that can explain it to some extent, but, but, um, but mostly it, it is, it, it, you know, the fact that people want to, um, you know, to vote for Mélenchon or for Marine Le Pen instead of Macron in the legislative elections has really to do with the fact that uh, they, they are not Macron supporters in terms of policies. Uh, the majority of people oppose his main policies, economic policy, are more skeptical than he is on, on Europe, are more skeptical even on, uh, you know, on NATO, although, uh, you know, like uh, Mélenchon, for example, would pull out of NATO. Uh, um, so, so there is a big, big differences there. But uh, uh, yeah, if uh, I don't think Mélenchon will will win a majority, but uh, uh, he, he will certainly have lots of, you know, weight in in the Macron second term, and and that uh, that is not necessarily a good thing either in the assembly or on the streets. <laughs> well, one last question, and I'm going to ask it: uh, if. Uh, Macron does not get 289 votes in the parliamentary elections. Who do you think he will choose as prime minister if he doesn't get his majority? Well, first of all, there is a new prime minister that was appointed, uh, you know, like three weeks ago. And, but with Macron, you know, people don't even notice their, these prime ministers because they oh. are kind of a, you know, collaborator. You know, they, are, they have really lost in, in stature. Uh, so Macron so far has had two prime ministers in his first term, and um, they were both, they came both from the center right, uh, you know, he was trying to poach, you know, support from the center right, and this one that he appointed after his uh, re-election comes from the left, she was, uh, she was a socialist, but she was uh, one of his cabinet ministers, and he appointed her just to try to limit the, the Mélenchon wave, if you want, because she's on the left. Yeah. And so, she, you know, she, was def, she would deflect, you know, the momentum of, of Mélenchon a little bit. Um, and, um, but, okay, so she's likely to remain, certainly if Macron has a majority, which is unlikely, I think, uh, even if, if he has a minority. But if, uh, if Macron needs is so short of, of the majority of 289 votes and has to strike an alliance with Les Républicains, which is the, the neo gaullist party, yeah. uh, then you can imagine that, um, that he might change his prime minister just after a few weeks. Right. Uh, I think that would be an extreme uh, scenario, but it's possible. Um, I think basically Macron will try to not to strike an alliance with LR. Uh, it would be, it would have to give up too much, uh, but to um, have, you know, to make sure that he would have some individual deputies supporting him on this or that piece of legislation. I see. 
but that could be very unstable. So, so very, very difficult. Very, very, very unstable. Yes. Yeah. So it's an uncertain situation. Well, so thank maybe. you very much, Patrick. This has been fascinating. I've learned, and I'm sure everybody else has learned so much about French political life. And we can use this reading the newspapers uh, in the weeks ahead. And Absolutely. everybody else, we look forward to seeing you on September 20th, Peter Bartu talking on the Middle East and have a delightful summer. Thank you, Frank, and thank Merci. you, everyone. Merci, au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. <laughs>